If you're driving, please remember to use your car's Bluetooth speaker while listening to the AM Drive. Sports talk is not worth your safety or the safety of others. Thank you. Happy Monday to everyone in the sports universe. It is March the 27th, 2023. For Aaron Crouch, I am Michael Carvelis. This is the AM Drive. Aaron, how was your weekend in sports and how was your weekend in general? Uh, you know what? I watched a little bit of the basketball games, but other than that, my weekend did not involve a ton of sports. It's kind of nice. It's almost like football and basketball. Like once the football season ends, you do have to like kind of grab NBA and NHL during the week most days and most times. So, but that makes sense. Yeah, I mean Saturday caught the t- you know caught a little bit of the of the of the night's game, but uh, yeah, yesterday I was it was nice. Spent time with the family. We went out for breakfast with some extended family and wow. did some shopping, saw the Easter bunny, and uh, it was kind of nice. Is that for your kid? Yeah, we'll go or with that. Or is that for you? <laughs> See, I can blame all that stuff on the kid now, though. That's funny. Um, I watched Caitlin Clark, unfortunately, the first game, because the next game she drew for Iowa, the great college women's player, because the next game, she um, drops a 40-point triple-double. First time in tournament it. history. It, 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 that's, in, that's insane. Yeah, it's a pretty impressive feat. I mean, it doesn't happen in men's or women's basketball, uh, you know, in the college game very often. And when it does, it's something to be celebrated. Who was the last girl to do it? Uh, I don't know about a 40-pointer, but didn't Sabrina Ionescu was the last one to wear a triple-double? Well, yeah, last week you were a triple double, but not never forty points. Forty points is a lot for a, a women's college basketball game. So hats off to her. Oh yeah, she, her, and um, Haley Van Lith. Excuse me. Oh my gosh, the future is bright in the WNBA. <laughs> yeah, now that Brady, now that Brady owns the team, right? <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, let's get to our first thing here because we got four left, and we're going to break this down by each game. Final four. FAU, San Diego State, and then Final Four, Miami, UConn. Let's get to FAU and San Diego State first. I told people, and I didn't pick them to win because I have a bracket for crying out loud. I told people San Diego State was my biggest concern for Alabama on Friday's show. I said it on Monday's show, too, I think. Because they're, they're real coached, and I've seen them like play good teams tough before. And I, they beat them pretty good, right? Uh, Alabama, uh, they beat yeah. them by like, I think they beat them by like seven or eight. Yeah. So it, it's like it was a thriller. Like they actually like just beat them. FAU, if you had told me before this tournament started, then the final four FAU would have the least amount of losses all season. I would say, ha, huh, okay. See you in the next life. <laughs> but um, they have three losses all season. And I think FAU is a tough opponent for San Diego State. Sure. I mean, I agree with that. I mean, FAU has been dodging bullets this entire tournament. I mean, they had one point win against Memphis. They took on the the Cinderella, the original Cinderella, Fairleigh Dickinson, beat them, you know, just by uh, eight points. They became, right. with that attempted dunk, that windmill dunk at the end, they actually became a little bit of an enemy, uh, you know, a little bit of a villain there because uh, of what they did against Fairleigh Dickinson. Uh, took took care of Tennessee minus a point guard for Tennessee, and then of course we had a thriller uh, against Kansas State here just this weekend. But yeah, I mean FAU is playing with house money. They're a quality opponent. San Diego State should not take them lightly. I would guess that no one else has yet. But you know FAU, uh, excuse me, Kansas State's coach after the game walked into FAU's locker room and said, "You guys were the toughest team we've played." I mean, this is a Big Twelve, Big Twelve coach. You guys were the toughest team we played all year. Now, maybe some of that's fluff. I don't know because it's a it's an elite. Coach, why would a coach do that? Yeah, but what well, coach has no incentive to to come in and tell a team how good they are or how much of a you know a, 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 of an opponent they were against a Big Twelve opponent. I mean, we're talking about a, I believe a Conference USA team here right now. Uh, you know, he like you said, he the incentive is just not there to tell them that. So. FAU feels like they could just hang with anybody. And, and to be honest with you, it's got to feel even better. I mean, all all the tournament long, they've faced teams that probably aren't supposed to be there. I mean, San Diego State, like we talk about Alabama was probably a better team 
in that bracket. You know, okay, look at, you know, Michigan, I'm uh, sorry, Marquette's Michigan State getting knocked out. Kansas State probably wasn't supposed to be there. They, they obviously didn't play Purdue. They didn't play the number one seed, you know. So FAU is probably looking at this like, you know, hey, man, we can we can take on anybody. But the thing is, we're taking on the what the committee believes is lesser teams. And, and, and we're knocking them out. Uh, and, and I'll be honest. I mean, if you look at these two national championship semifinal games, this is the one I believe that has the less talented players in it. This Miami UConn game is going to be hopefully one for the ages. I think this, this final four is like the ultimate anti chalk bracket ever. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, this is no, insane. No number one seeds in the Elite Eight for the first time ever. That that was pretty cool, and that's been going on since 1975 when they started that stuff. Yeah, I mean we've had we've had Final Fours with no number one seeds, but right. we've never had eight with no number one seeds in it. That's pretty wild. And now we're in the Final Four, and it's even it's going to look even better now. I mean, you look at you look at the way this this tournament started. I mean, a lot of people said, you know, hey, look, you have to have number one seeds because that's just the way tournaments are set up. But we don't have. We don't have that team, you know, that dog, you know, that 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 team that everybody's like, well, that, you know, why are we even playing this? Alabama, they said look like the best team, but oh, you know, all you brought it. Long, I mean, I mean, hell, they lost in the middle of the season to UConn by twenty points. You know what, though, I mean, on paper, this looks like San Diego State versus UConn for the championship. Correct. But I mean, paper, paper, be you know, out the window. I mean. Huh? Paper means nothing now. Right. We're just going to litter this thing out the window. Yeah, you're right. Um, Final Four, Miami and UConn. Miami was not supposed to beat Texas. I, I know they did beat Texas, so people were going to say, oh, you're still right. I get it. But they weren't supposed to beat them. They were down for a lot of that game. As you said, UConn um, took care of Alabama, who was supposedly the best team in the country. And maybe nine times out of ten they are until they play in this, you know, the Elite Eight <laughs> against San Diego State. But, um, oh, guess, um, in the Sweet 16, I mean, but really, UConn, I was doing some research before the show, I told you this, their coach apparently, like, builds powerhouses everywhere he goes. Like, started with yeah. high school, up to, like, the lower colleges, and now up to this thing. UConn, I think, won a championship, like, with Kevin Ollie as the coach, like, in 2012 or whatever that was, when they beat Kentucky. I think it was Kentucky, they'd be like, eh. Maybe some some big like Anthony Davis or Carly, whatever it was, they beat somebody. Right. Yeah. They've, they've been a very big ebb and flow program because since the early '90s, since the you know Ray Allen years and the Riff Hamilton years and then the Kemba Walker years, they're just they have these peaks where they're just on top. I mean, they're absolutely in, they build absolutely incredible teams, and then they have valleys where they're just they're in the Ooh. doghouse. But yeah, UConn is a, an incredible story here. Uh, Miami too. I mean. You could really argue. I know Texas was ahead at half, but the team that gave Miami the biggest fits was Drake, their opening round opponent. I mean, Drake was up with like five minutes left, and eventually Miami took over, and they've just been able to kind of build that momentum, ride that wave all the way to the Final Four here. But, you're, I mean, UConn. UConn's closest game is a 15-point win in the, in the tournament right now. How insane is that? I mean, they beat Iona by 24, yeah. same at 15. Arkansas by 23 and and UConn or I'm sorry and, and Gonzaga by 28. I mean in an elite eight game they're beating Gonzaga by 28 points. I mean, I mean maybe Gonzaga you know gave everything they had against UCLA. I get it. Against the last two opponents, Gonzaga did that. Yeah, I, I could see. It, yeah, right. yeah, that's fair. But I think that's going to be the better game on the on the docket here uh, on in uh, what this Saturday. And um, the only thing I don't like is that we play this this championship game on Monday night. It's so lame. Just play it Sunday. Just play like, it Sunday. Well, we got to lose NASCAR? Come on, man. No offense to NASCAR. Just... No, no offense to anything. I, I mean, just Monday night, and I think it start, I think it tips off at like 9 o'clock Eastern or something. No like one's going to watch that. It's always tough. I get it. You know, it's – but um, – I think the 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 April first games. I mean, the the, the final four games are going to be way more interesting than any uh, any championship game we get because maybe like UConn's UConn's going to take it all, but I don't think Miami's going to go on without a fight. This will be Miami. I think this will be UConn's closest closest game. I think UConn is going to um, win it all. I really do. And I don't know if I had them. If I would have made a bracket, had I had them because 
I liked them, but I I thought I saw Texas getting out of this one. Well, Texas, I, I, Texas was getting hot at the end of the season. Yeah, I mean Texas had to, Texas lost to Miami, but yeah, UConn. UConn in that in that region, I had Kansas getting out. I really thought Kansas had a good shot at repeating. You know, I didn't really give Gonzaga the time of day, and I didn't see anything I else. Either. I didn't see anything else in that bracket. I mean, I know everybody was all in love with UCLA, but I mean, they just had so many injuries just piling up. It's it's the be- it's a beautiful thing. Like now with everything revised, now I hope FAU wins. I'm I'm rooting for them. I don't think they're going to win the title, but I would it would it would be even nice to to have them in the championship game. I think it's going to be FAU and UConn. That'd be cool. I, I think UConn would smack them, but I, I'll be rooting for FAU. At this I'm going to tell you why FAU, because it's like, it's a story of two dominant teams here. We have UConn, who's got the coach that builds powerhouses and blows out teams in the tournament, which just never happens. And then you've got FAU, who went like 35-3. and three. Like They're like showing, like, who needs the CUSA for crying out loud? Well, I'll ask I mean, you they this. Dominate, they dominate their league. <laughs> How much do you believe that the NCAA March Madness Tournament is such an advocating proof that we need expansion in football? I mean, it's a tough conversation because it's obvious. Well, not to everybody. Well, I mean, I want to like, what are their counterpoints? Like, what? Are, or how stupid are we? Well, you get the whole, you know, okay, well, when TCU goes up against Georgia and it's 63 to 7, it, it's kind of tough to kind of tough to argue that. But I'm just saying, like, I feel like expanding the playoff, I believe, would even out recruiting. Now, are you gonna see an FAU in the in the final four every year? No, but I mean you look at the top 16 teams in college football, you know, you have Oregon's, Oregon State, USC, you have Alabama's, you have LSU, you have teams from all around the nation. It's not just an SEC invitational at that point, you know? So, and I really believe that, you know, guys in the Midwest might stay, you know, home in Oklahoma, or they might, they might, you know, guys in the West might stay home at USC or Oregon or UCLA, or, you know, some of these other teams that are moving into bigger conferences like UCF and the big 12. Hey man, you get to that top 16, you can get into a playoff. And what does playoff include? National exposure. I mean, you know, is anybody from FAU going to go pro? Probably not. But you know what? There's there's maybe a chance that scouts are looking at the guys from FAU and Miami and San Diego State and UConn. You know, like you you get you get a chance to be on the stage and showcase your talents. And I think that this is just a no brainer. Like, how do we how do we sit here and root for teams like Princeton to be a you know a Sweet Sixteen team and FAU? Oh yeah, Final Four FAU. But then when it comes to football, we're like, well, you know, well, you know why? Nobody can beat Georgia. Well, maybe nobody can beat Georgia, but make them go through a gauntlet, you know? I I, I think anybody who says that this not a no-brainer wants to debate it is, is a homer and they have ulterior motives. That's it. How do you not root for that? Like, it's just like as a sports fan, like, when does your own ego of your own stupid school get in the way? Like, who gives a crap? You're not but, there anymore. Like, shut up and, and accept entertainment. But it's literally the only sport that does it. I mean, us as NFL fans, you know, you, you, you're like, hey man, just get in the playoffs and anything can happen. Hockey, hockey is the biggest proponent of hey man. And the fact that the NFL does that and college football homers are so weird about, like, come on, man. It's literally the only sport. It's literally the only sport where we're like, okay, yes, we do have a playoff for teams, but we have 130 college football teams, and I'm asking for 16. You know, and for, those asking- that, for those who say Georgia can't be beat. I raised you Georgia, Missouri this year. I raised you Alabama and Texas this year. I know, I know it's Texas and Missouri, SEC, and you know a big Big Twelve school. But I mean, no one saw those games being close. But that's the thing. Why are Why are we not rooting for more games? More games is more excitement for the fans. More games is more money for college more playoff fo- games. That's what I mean. Yes, of right. course. More money for college football. It's a win win. Like I just, to me, it. You know, every year, I just don't understand why we, why we, why this is the only sport, college football, that we argue against expanding playoff fields. This will be the last thing I'll say for those that want the cupcake schedule. Because basically, what you're going to do if you have a 16 team playoff, you're going to drop it down to probably 10 games. So that takes off the stupid Alabama beating up on a Philly Dickinson or whatever. Yeah. And that, you know, well, maybe they get like one cupcake game. And I feel like that helps the other school too, supposedly. It also helps Alabama way more than it helps them. And so I, I believe 
that anybody who, like I said, roots against it has ulterior motives in their home or so. Sure. And then I think that would actually open the door to them actually scheduling better opponents in the regular season. Now, I know we have kickoff weekend in college football and things like that, but you're right. We would get rid of this Alabama versus Citadel, Georgia versus Western Carolina, you know. Western and, Carolina. <laughs> you know, hey, look, I can still get into the playoff even if I'm a two loss, maybe even a three loss team. Great website, by the way, MikeAaronDrive.com. I dig it. I dig it, too. It's Monday. I'm a little bit cranky and tired over here, but we're, we're making through it. I'm kidding. Um, when we come back, we're going to talk about Pro D analysis by Todd McShay. I've got some nice little liners from him on the top prospects in college football. Also, some NBA stuff, including Trey Young got really stupid this weekend. Almost cost me a fantasy championship. I'll talk about it next. All right, welcome back here into the Monday edition of the AM Drive, and we are presented by Fanatics. You see it right there. You got to go to this website right here, MikeAndAaronDrive.com, and click that F. When you click it, it takes you into the Fanatics website. You can shop until you drop everything, merchandise, memorabilia, apparel, everything that you need for your favorite teams, leagues, and players are all available at Fanatics. But please, please help out the channel and go to MikeAndAaronDrive.com first. Click that Fanatics logo. It gets us, full disclosure, a small little piece of the pie, and that's what we need to keep bringing you awesome sports content each and every Monday and Friday. So hear me out on this, like on the Fanatics thing. I know this is a dumb thing to talk about if we just plug that. But um, can you um tell me, like, I know they're going to give us a piece of the pie if people click on the link, obviously, and buy something. Do they lose money from that technically, or like do we, or they just like have it extra somewhere? I don't understand how that, how they can profit from that. <laughs> I, guess, it, I guess because so little people do it, I guess it doesn't affect them. Well, it comes out of their profit margin. I mean, it's right. there's probably, let, let's be honest, and I don't, I don't want to go too deep into this, but let's be honest, there's, they're probably, you know, merchandise is marked up and, you know, there's a profit margin of say 60%. Well, Right. You know, we get kicked back a certain percentage for when you buy. It comes just a little bit out of that profit margin. And to be honest with you, for them, it's all about volume. The more they sell, the more they make. Even if 2%, you know, 2%, 3%, 4% comes out of, of their profit margin, they still have a 70% profit margin. They're still making 65% profit. It's, 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 they're fine. It makes sense. It makes sense. I mean, I'm glad you said that. And like I said, I wasn't going to talk about a lot. That was my fault. I just, I never thought about it till now. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's it's giving a little to get a lot, and you know, Fanatics is great as a as a as a, an ambassador program, and we've been with Fanatics for a long time, and it's it's been great, and you know, hopefully you guys see this, and when you know, hey, I gotta go buy some sports stuff, you know, uh, let me let me stop by MikeAndAaronDrive.com first and help those guys out, and of course, we always appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, one more thing I'll say about Fanatics, I love like it's one universal link for so many leagues. Like you have every college team uses it. You like every broadcast you hear like NBA shop or I mean, NBA store, NFL shop. It's all on Fanatics, so it's it's really cool. I well, love like I don't know how every sport agreed to that. It's great by Fanatics. Well, it's 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 a licensing deal. So right. it, it being an ambassador, those leagues are kind of an ambassador as well. They get a little piece of the profit margin too. Mm -hmm. So that's why volume is key for Fanatics. But breaking news, uh, maybe to some people. Fanatics has officially signed a deal with uh, the NHL to be their official jersey on ice jersey supplier. I Adidas ice jersey on ice like they're gonna oh, make okay, okay, okay. the ice Adidas. Adidas was making those for the last few years, and now they're gonna be Fanatics jerseys. Okay, so let me tell you right now. I have a Kyle Guy jersey. And people talk about it, it rubs off the sticker. No, it doesn't. 
I don't know. I've heard people like honest questions. Since we're talking about this, I think it's a good point. Um, people were concerned, like, because fanatics, I guess, supposedly years ago had a reputation of like selling cheaper. I mean, they are cheaper because it's obviously not marked up for the leagues, but it's literally the same thing. Like, there's no like the same people like who say like that that's I'm an authentic jersey. Those same ones that like will go to like those jerseycrate.com and buy like a jersey from China for ten for like ten bucks. Okay. It's just, they're all the same jersey. It's okay. Yeah, they uh, – now, I think when they become the official, you know, actual, re- you know, on-eye supplier, uh, I do believe that the quality of that material will get a little bit better. Now, Agreed. you know, for the fans, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, an exact, you know, same, you know, material that is used by the actual players. But uh, I will say this. I've had Fanatics jerseys for years, and – now I don't wear them every single day and every single right. place. You wear them every single day and sweat in them and wash and them. Dumb. If you wash them, you know that's that's going to create problems for you. So if you're complaining about things like that, then you kind of really need to reevaluate how you view clothing. I mean, because clothing does accumulate wear and tear as you wash it and as you wear it more. Now, if you wear your jersey, you know, at the games or things like that, or if you're just sitting around the house, yeah, you're probably your jersey's going to last a little bit longer. I would prefer Nike under one circumstance because they have been doing great with the NBA jerseys, in my opinion. Like they have looked like real. There's a lot of cool special jerseys, but I'm okay with to see what what Fanax does with their creativity department. So, yeah, I mean, I am I'm curious too because I, you know I can understand people's speculation about the actual jerseys on ice. I am curious right. about. I do hope that Fanatics will, you know, kind of increase their production quality for that. We'll see. I think they will. Um, Tom McShay, NFL draft expert from ESPN, has um talked about the pro days. I don't, I guess, I, I know he didn't attend every single one of these, but it was basically like he got word from what from what happened. Obviously, he's a source too. So he right. talked about Will Levis, Bryce Young, and CJ Stroud pro days on an ESPN Plus article. So lucky for you guys, I and I think you too have ESPN Plus. Correct. So I want I want to get through like I want to break three of these down. The three that we're t- talking about here, um, Will Levis, um, is, is ranked number fourteen on his board and number three quarterback behind CJ and Bryce. Mm-hmm. He's six foot four, two twenty nine. His title on this was more tied together, but work to do. Basically, um, uh, he's been working with a guy for eight weeks now, trying to better tie his lower half to his upper body. I have noticed that in, in watching tape as well that he was very sporadic, which is why I compared him to Carson Wentz. I was like, what are you doing there? That was weird. And then another thing they said was um, you can still see the tightness in his mechanics, which aren't a finished product. His placement on in-breaking throws wasn't ideal, which is a lot in the NFL. So what is your take on Will Levis as a quarterback and what is your take on what the briefing you read from Tom McShay? So – What I obviously tend to go with, and and to me, this isn't a knock or anything. I mean, pro days to me just don't mean anything. He said that too, that you're right about that. You know, uh, what what do I see from the tape? And now I saw a little bit of a a lack of Will Levis because he was hurt a lot this year. But what I see was quality football. Now, he does have that strong arm a la Josh Allen. He does have the ability to kind of make the receiver he throw the receiver open i do like that from a quarterback uh is he a polished product no i I agree with with tom mcshay with that i believe i believe we're looking at a guy like kenny pickett who doesn't run as well and i know i know your feelings on kenny pickett I, i believe both of these guys kenny pickett and will levis going to the right situations which i believe did happen for kenny pickett um can make these guys into serviceable or upper tier starting quarterbacks, franchise quarterbacks. Well, look at Daniel I, Jones. He went to the right spot with De- Brian Dables. You're right. Well, he went to the right spot. Brian Dable finally came in. Yes. Right. Uh, and if, Bri- if if Daniel Jones went to the Bills, who knows what he could have been? You know, if Josh Allen wasn't there, obviously with Don't Brian D- with Brian Dable being there. You know. Uh, anyways. Right. Uh, know what that right spot is because every player seems to be so unique that the fits really have to fit tightly any kind of loose airway or hole and and, and things can come apart but 
Um, I, I, honestly, I believe like this might sound crazy, but a team like the 49ers feel like a spot for for Will Levis. And, and I know that's kind of like a Brock Purdy thing, but I, I'm just not a believer in Trey Lance. And, and you know, I don't know if Will Levis will be there, you know, in the late 20s for, for San Francisco. But if if they traded up for Trey Lance, it's, it's we can't rule out that they would do that again. You know, so, um, yeah, Will Levis, I, I don't think he needs to start right away. So find mm-hmm. a team, and stash him, teach him, mold him, develop him. I mean, another team could be the Seattle Seahawks. I know they have Geno. I know that there are talks with Anthony Richardson. But, uh, you know, I'm curious to see when the chips fall where Anthony Richardson really does go. Because the hype has him anywhere from first pick all the way to fifth round. So. I didn't see – did you see Aaron, Anthony Richardson on this? Because I, I didn't. I, that was weird. But I, I'm glad you brought him up because I didn't really see him on this list. No, he wasn't. And I think That's that Tom really looking at pocket passing quarterbacks. Now, I'm not saying that CJ and, and, and uh, Bryce and Will Levis can't run. I'm just saying I think they're tr- more, they, they, they play a more traditional style. At least they did in college. Bryce Young um, – is still number one on McShay's board, and for what that's worth, just letting people know, I'm just saying, in quarterback one, he's five foot ten, and that's a lot more generous than what like a five eight and three fourths that we saw the other day or whatever. Um, he's two hundred four pounds, and Pete, there was talk. I, I don't think this crap matters if you can play. You can play. I keep saying that. I understand it, but they were saying he was gonna be like one hundred and eighty five. He was two hundred four, so they think he's put on some muscle, and that's been like huge for him. So Bryce Young. Um, he basically said it was another fantastic pro day, quick release, getting the ball out early and on time. Another thing is, um, I, I found this interesting. Tom McShay said he spoke to Crimson Tide coach Nick Saban during an athletic commercial. I'm kidding. A little bit on Thursday too. He likened Young to Drew Brees now, that, but not in the way you think with the size. He said in the way he sees the field and handles the rest. That basically says what I've said is why Bryce was the far and away best quarterback. Everything just came easy to him. Like there were some I like yeah, Will Levis and Anthony Richardson might be better long term. CJ Stroud might be better long term. Bryce Long is just ready to go. He's the one people always say, oh he's ready to play. This is your guy that's ready to play. What are your thoughts on Bryce? So this one's tough. Like I said, Bryce Young played really well two years ago <clears throat> when he won the Heisman. You know, and this last year, he he kind of stumbled a little bit. You know, I know yeah. that he played well against the teams that he's supposed to play well against, but you know, he got he got stuck in some spots. You know, and for me, it just these five foot ten, five foot nine quarterbacks. It's it's a gamble. Yeah, mm-hmm. for every Drew Brees, there's you know a Kyler Murray. Now I know the <laughs> out on Kyler Murray, so we'll see. But you know. I, I want to like Bryce Young. I really do because he's a nice kid. I, just, I think C.J. Stroud, if you're going to take one of these two quarterbacks, <clears throat> I think C.J. Stroud feels more like the safer pick. But then again, how many times have I said, I believe in the curse of the Ohio State quarterback? I just See, That's a real thing. People are talking about it. I just, and, and then, of course, the added weight of this team, if Carolina is the team to select one of these two guys, let's stay on Bryce Young here, the added weight of you were traded up for. Think how much got dumped on Mitch Trubisky because the Bears traded up one pick. Reason I bought the jersey. And, I mean, think about it here. Think about this, too. You know, all, Deshaun Watson and Pat Mahomes were in Mitch Trubisky's draft. Now, could Will Levis become a superstar? I don't know. We'll see. Could C.J. Stroud become a superstar? Maybe. We'll see. I mean, I know that most likely if if Bryce Young goes one, C.J. is going two to Houston. Like, if he turns around a franchise and and you're the Carolina Panthers and you didn't you didn't you traded up and didn't draft him, like this becomes an added pressure here. Now, I know that playing at Tuscaloosa, there's already pressure. He was a superstar quarterback in high school in L.A. I just I. It, oh, and again, Bryce? it's such a crap shoot, and I'm not taking it away from – Todd McShay knows way more than I do, but I'm just not – I'm not feeling Bryce Young. I'm really not. Uh, this, this is one of those show moments where, like, later on we're going to look back on this. 
one of us is going to look really stupid and one of us is going to look really good. So I'm, I'm, I, I like this. I like this. I'm okay if I'm wrong. I mean, no, I'm okay I, if I'm wrong too. I'm just saying, like in general, one of us is going to be on the one side of the spectrum here. Yeah, but how many years is that going to take? Three, two, three. You playing okay. on the game driving two years? Come on, man! Don't don't bail now. I'm not bailing. I'm just saying, like you know, you know, it's like Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray had an incredible what rookie year and maybe his second year, okay. and then but he's fallen off. Like in the NFL, it's it's what have you done for me lately? I mean, like I said. Daniel Jones, many people should have thought he should have been out of the league, and then he has a great, what, fourth year, and now he's getting $40 million a year. Sweet. I'm good with that. NFL's crazy like that. <laughs> um, Next up, Kyrie the Team Killer, Episode 3. Revenge of the I – don't, I don't know. You know, I know it's only like a, 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 an 11 – I'm just saying he's a team killer. I know, like I've said – um that Kyrie is going to ruin this team because it was a desperation move by Mark Cuban. It still might be that, but I don't think three and eight or 11, excuse me, I didn't mean to say that an 11 game sample sample size is the correct term for me to boast my chest, but God dang Aaron is a great start for me. I <laughs> told people it wasn't just the bat. And even if it is a basketball side, Kyrie's a point guard who doesn't pass. Unfortunately, Bill Mavericks are taking away from Luca's touches. This entire Mavericks team, Aaron, was based on the fact that Luca could drive or break down guys and throw it to the corner for Dorian Finney-Smith, who's no longer on the team, or to Spencer Dimity, who's no longer on the team and is thriving in Brooklyn, okay? Come on. All this for Kyrie, man. Gave up your The reason you were there last year, you did it for Kyrie, and they're 3-8 and eight, losing to not great teams. Well, the worst part is... is- you brought in Kyrie, but at the same time, you let Jalen Brunson walk by really not, Bingo. you know, trying not, to, not really trying to match the Knicks, who Jalen Brunson has turned into somewhat of a star. Insane. You know, I wanted to find a way to not blame this on Kyrie, but the minute Luca said, you know, coming to the arena and playing, it's not fun anymore. You heard, I'm glad. I didn't even show you that. I'm so glad you said that. And when he said that, it was it was surprising to me. Now, again, that might not just be Kyrie Irving, but it's just the vibe and the energy. And then weren't we talking a couple weeks ago about him talking about cobalt mines and lithium mining and how and he – And wherever that was, Nigeria, I don't know. Can't be free until, until they're free. I just – it's just like you got to wonder what – how does he communicate with his teammates in the locker room? And people go like, well, that's freedom of speech. I don't care. It's like true. like you said, that matters. Locker room speech, like banter matters. You're free to speak your mind and say whatever you want. But the problem is, is that you're not free from the consequences of what people believe. We see it every day with politics. We see it every day on Twitter. Like, yeah, you can say whatever the hell you want, but people are going to react to you. And if the people that are closest to you from a sports standpoint are going to react unfavorably to you. Then again, you can have whatever beliefs you want. Like I, like I said, I, I was, I was on Kyrie's camp with, with certain things. I'm, I'm against Kyrie with certain things. I, I think, I think he's literally like, I think he's at least in Dallas so far and, and probably Brooklyn. I think he's a team. He's a team killer. He absolutely is. Jason Kidd is like a coach who prides himself on defense. I've never seen Kyrie play great defense in my life. Brunson and Dinwiddie would like fight on defense, even though they were smaller. Like they would they would hustle. They would do those small things. And you have a star like Luca. You can't have two stars like Luca. Like two guys who want the ball. Two guys like it's just even Chris Paul with the Houston Rockets. I know that was a different reason why they crumbled. And then Chris Paul was a pass first guard, so that worked for a guy like James Harden who could then do his thing. Well, all guards, and Kyrie, they don't know what to do. Huh? All point guards should be passed first. Traditionally, I yes. I don't care if you put up 30, but your assist, you should be have you should have at least seven assists tonight. Yeah, that's easy enough. I mean, there's enough touches in a high pace. You're right. But for me, you know, and then Dallas is <sighs> minus the Grizzlies, they're Losing now, they lost to the Warriors, but the Warriors came to Dallas. They're a terrible road team. You gave the the Warriors a win, and now you've lost back to back games to the Hornets, dude. Hornets literally, and they they almost scored like 104 points in one of those games. And I almost tweeted out like, 
Where are the Hornets like getting like a, up like 140? Where'd that go? They're still taking. So we're, why are we getting 104 against them? Now, one thing I, I will say, uh, and it, it does involve Kyrie, but it doesn't. I will say that their depth is gone. Bingo, which is what I said. And one of the reasons is the pieces they traded for Kyrie. So, you know, I don't know. For, for whatever reason, now it's not like it's a tough stretch of the season. I know they've lost, you know, three to the Grizzlies within recent times, but um, I think two of those were without John Morant. So uh, you were playing so much better basketball with the team you had. What? And I don't know if this is a Cuban thing. I don't know if Cuban is like Jerry Jones. But what did the front office believe Kyrie was going to do for you? I still, I know what you're saying. I'm trying to like answer the question while also getting back to what I said, I said before. Go I got to think, if you're going to do that, go get Durant, not Kyrie. You said that. You did say that when it happened. Yeah. I mean, we talked about it pre, I think preseason, like people you wanted to see Luka Doncic play with, and Kevin Durant was one of them. Because Kevin Durant's so and so you know how unselfish Kevin Durant is. I do not like Kevin Durant's. But he joins the Warriors and takes a back seat half the time, even though he was clutch sometimes. He joins the Suns, he takes a back seat if Devin Booker needs it. Kyrie does not take any back seats. He's driving the bus to the flat over off the flat earth edge. <laughs> I, I, yep. I'm you know, like I said, like I'm you know, I'm not a Kyrie guy. And, you know, even if even if you can determine that he's not the reason things are going down, just surely his presence there has caused this this downward plane for the Mavericks. So, I mean, they're two and seven since actually yeah, two and seven in the last night, three and eight since he got acquired. Three say? and eight with Luca. I mean, like there's the work, the record's even different with when Luca doesn't play with him or Luca doesn't play with him or whatever. Yikes. Yeah, it's not good. Um, NBA refs versus stars. Speaking of Luca, this is insane. Um, basically, Luca, when you get your 16th technical foul, you're going to get suspended the game. Correct. Uh, you can appeal it whatever you want, but Luca got a 16th tech. And he, to be fair, he whines a lot. Now, as for Trey Young, I don't know if you saw this, but Trey Young literally looked away and delivered like a Hall of Fame bullet badge pass to a referee who thankfully caught the ball, but he was not trying to just throw it to him to pass it to him. He was a little like just tossing it, not giving a crap where it went at the referee. And now he's in his 15th tech. I'm surprised he could play yesterday after that had happened Saturday. But Aaron, there's a bigger issue here. And they've talked about it before. It's not a fun topic, but I've been on the... I've been on the fence with this one sometimes, leaning more towards the refs. People like to say, well, the you know, you know, after every single loss, what do, what do fans do automatically? What would the Bengals fans do? What do everyone do? Blame the officials. They blame the officials. Even if, like, forget the fact, even like if, if the call was judgmental, even, let's say it was a blatant, it was blatant wrong or right. Okay, I get that. But there are times after every single loss in today's age, we do this. And then you combine the fact where they they think like the refs want to want to be the be the big guys here, but every single player I watch, even LeBron does it now. That he flops, be, and I think it's in the same area with with the complaining stuff. You're trying to sell the game to try to get your calls, and to me, there's a line the refs have to draw. Even with kids in the stands, with people watching, how referees are they don't want the mouse in the palace ever again. Okay. We get close. Sometimes we'll get like, you know, the fights, you know, the head or whatever. Referees are jet guys because if they get mad at the refs and they let it slide over and over and over again, that stuff will happen. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds stupid right now, but the more you let a guy get angrier and angrier and angrier and don't eject him for saying horrible things, he's going to get even worse. He's going to he's going to escalate because you're push, not calling the game he wants to call. Oh, well. That push the boundaries to see how far they are, you know, what they can get away with. I don't, I don't blame them, but you, you find out real quick what's too far. Now, uh, this might be some get off my lawn, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand on the lawn for a second here. Hmm. Now, when I was watching basketball, technical fouls were a big deal, and Rasheed Wallace was really painted a, as a goon and yep. an idiot, 
and a, and a, and a, and a, and a bumbling retard for lack of a better word for the amount of technicals which really was only this many and now we see two of the young stars in the game and and i'm sure i could find more people but you know trey young 15 technical fouls luka Doncic, 16 technical fouls like to me you're i don't want to use the word thug but yeah i mean you're breeding a game where people where these guys can act like idiots on the ball court and why are your stars this high in technicals is it you're letting these stars become temper tantrum throwing idiots or you're right. These referees are becoming too much a part of the game. Which way do you see this right now? I, I see, I see the, the, I'm against the stars on this. And I love both. You know, I love Trey and I love Luca. I know. I know. And, and I'm just like, but bias aside, I'm, a, I'm, I'm on the ref side on this one. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to. I'd like to think that in this spot, I watched the video, and you can't see the referee in the well, trade. Yeah, I'd like to think the referee was looking when he threw that pass. Uh, it does say in the in the in the article I'm reading, the referee did catch the ball. So, right. uh, I mean, are you mad because he threw it too hard at you? Are you mad because you know, like, are you looking to, excuse me, make an example out of him? But like. You know, you don't see guys like Giannis and 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 Jokic and, and other guys like that. You don't see them r- racking up the technicals, unless I'm wrong. I don't have the technical sheet in front of me, but Jokic will complain. Giannis can complain, but I've never seen them explode like Luca and Trey do. Complain? I, I mean, LeBron That's complains. That's cool. They all complain. They all kind of, you know, throw a little whiny, you know, crying face. I get that. Oh, what are you doing? It's not me. You know, and the, you know this this crap. I'm, I'm okay with that because it's been happening for years. I mean, Michael Panter for calls, all these guys in the 80s Panter for calls. I get it. Um, but you're right. Like, I don't know what Luca said. Luca clearly said something that, that set that that referee off. But, I mean, obviously, Trey Young throwing a ball, you know, at a referee. Again, I understand the referee was looking. They probably didn't like the fact that he threw it that hard. I, you know, what if, even if he was looking, he missed a ball coming that fast. You know, he's not a professional athlete. Um, right. I, this is a tough one because I, I'm never in the camp of just blindly defending refs because I do right. believe refs need a complete overhaul. However, you know my feeling on refs. I believe refs are in bed with the, the leagues to help control games. <laughs> but I uh, don't want to go down that one right now. But I, uh, I, I don't think I can side with the stars with this. I feel like it's becoming a much more immature league when we have superstars who are pushing the boundaries of the suspension line with technical fouls. I think there's a line you can draw because people are going to say like, we sound like old heads and like, we sound like we don't want the game to be on my lawn. Right. And we don't want people, people like the game to change. I'm 26. And and what are you 30? I'm 35. You're 35. If you were, if we were both forty and fifty with like beers, like and gray hair over here, I would understand their point. I'm 26. I'm in the prime, my athletic, supposedly, I'm in my athletic prime. Okay, you're still technically an NBA player at this point at 35 years old. Okay, LeBron's so old. we're not like we're not just losers here. That like we want to be entertained. Still, we're not just like all set in our ways. Well. This isn't one of the, like, I, I know I said get off my lawn, but this isn't one of those scenarios where I'm like, you know, take away the three pointer. No, I mean, right. like, stop acting like a freaking child. That's not, that's not, I don't, I don't find that as, you know, I don't care what age you are. Like, you're a professional athlete firing a ball at somebody. And, you know, I know you may not have had the intent to injure, but it's just like in hockey, I'll say this, you know, there's a lot of high sticking calls where the, the guy's stick maybe gets deflected or accidentally in the other player's face. It doesn't matter. You're responsible for the actions of your stick in basketball. You're responsible for your actions. You fire a ball and just because the other guy doesn't catch it, there's no realm where you're supposed to fire a ball that hard at somebody when the, when the whistle is blown. <laughs> like, so you're responsible for maybe breaking a guy's nose you know, taking away his livelihood. <clears throat> and you know what? It's possible that maybe what he said created the technical and the and the past wasn't even a, a relevant at that point. And people I like th- that the words will like shouldn't hurt you. That's that's a little of absolute crap, like to your point. 
Because I, I, I find it very annoying. Like, these guys trash each other all game. They probably say stuff to the refs. I don't think people realize, I think the refs let them slide a lot with their language. Probably. But I think there's certain things, I think there's certain words that, um, what, what? I'm sure the word gets flown all over the court, so. Right, but what I'm saying is, I think there's these players know there's certain lines you cannot cross. I think they're told. I think NBA PA has, has probably made them aware of that. Uh, and I, I don't think wanna... to pretend that they just don't know what what to say is it, just it's just Gen Z entitlement. And I don't want to hear this sticks and stones for the referees when LeBron and Russell Westbrook and Kyrie are getting and Chris Paul are getting people kicked out, fans kicked out for saying things to them. Exactly. If it's you can't yet. Yeah. If you're gonna have fans kicked out then you need to be held accountable for some of the similar language that you speak to. Agreed. Let's take one more breaky break here. Get a Kit Kat or something. We are not even sponsored by Kit Kat. Um, we come back. <laughs> I know. We're talking about, um, what were we talking about? MLB. Oh, MLB. I'm dumb. MLB top 100. I'm still here. We'll be right back. Tell the wonderful people about the great site of Fanatics. Fanatics is great, but you know what's even greater? Mike and Aaron Drive.com and clicking that Fanatics logo. That's even better because it helps out this show tremendously. And, of course, you can get all the great things that you want to do to support your favorite sports team, player, or league all in one place. Fanatics and Mike and Aaron Drive.com. The winning combination, not like Luca and Kyrie. Gross. Um, Shoei Otani has been... Ranked the number one player by let me make sure I get this right. Um, a panel of baseball experts. Okay, so this is interesting. So, according to the media, Shohei Otani is number one, Mike Trout number two. They just had a recent face off, if I remember correctly. <laughs> they did. Aaron Judge is number three, number four is Manny Machado at his ripe age, and Freddie Freeman, I don't, is number five. As a person living in Georgia, I don't think Freddie Freeman is as good as people think he is. I'm sorry. I think I'm you're I think you're absolutely incorrect. I think Juan Soto ought to put him above him. You only put him I think you'd only put him above him because he's younger. But I mean last year, first year in LA, dude, the guy hits 325, 21 homers. I mean, he's he's got a six wins above replacement. I mean, he, you know, yeah, he's he's absolutely incredible. He, I, what or, position does he play defensively? He's a first baseman. That I can't get down with that. I'm sorry. Okay, I don't understand that, but I'll let you just have that, I guess. I'll take Mookie Betts over him. He's number nine. Yeah, I don't agree with that one uh, for me. But, again, this this is always kind of tough because every year it's every year it's, it's reevaluated, I guess, for lack of a better word. Now, mm. I mean, I think Nolan Arenado at number 10, I mean, he's probably one of the most consistent people over the last – seven or eight years but a lot of it was spent in colorado so he gets forgotten a lot so i think i mean honestly a lot of these top 10 are interchangeable shohei is not but i, I believe if you're looking at just specifically like last year if you're looking overall i think mike trout's number two but if you're looking at just last year aaron judge has got to be number two i mean he had one of the most historic seasons of all time he broke an american league he broke a american league home run record which stood for 70 something 80 something years so, it, you know, it really all depends on how – and everybody's resumes and everybody's beliefs and, and opinions are all different. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, Mookie Betts is probably a top five player for me. I'd want him over Juan Soto, but you have a younger guy who smashes a little bit better. Uh, <laughs> I don't think Manny Machado is a top five player. And so, again, I'm not going to – downplay their list because that's such an easy thing to do oh this is crap no it's not a crap list it's a, it's a strong <laughs> it's a strong list but you know a lot of these guys are interchangeable just based on opinions or feelings and you know like i said you know uh, for me i think shohei what he can do makes him one of the greatest players of all time however you know you look at it last year and and and, and he did both things just okay 
you know, he was a, he was a pretty good pitcher. He wasn't a great pitcher, and he was a pretty good hitter. He wasn't a great hitter. So right. But the fact that he can do both just makes him absolutely incredible. You know, it's that's just the way it goes. Ronald Cunha Jr. at fourteen, and then um, Francisco Lindor at seventeen. I don't like either. I think those guys are pretty good and good. Uh, but again, I mean, Ronald Acuna has struggled with injuries the last few years, right? So it's kind of tough to keep him high, which is like, which is why like Mike Trout being up there. I mean, the last what five years he's he's only played seventy percent of the games that <laughs> the Angels have played in. He's right. played playoff games in his career. He got he's had one playoff appearance and they got swept. I mean. Yeah, Mike Trout's absolutely incredible. But like, if you're looking at at a at a resume, you know, you put Aaron Judge over him. I mean, you just do. I'm excited for the MLB season. The reason I'm saying I'm excited is because, as you know, the pitch clock. And also, you saw the Astros 24 to one game. I didn't watch it, but wow. Yeah, I mean, spring training is. That happens tough. in spring training a lot. No, but it's tough to gauge a 24 to one game. I mean. We, we are definitely sure that scoring will be up. I'm curious to see how the books, the sports books adjust to this. Um, if they Free decide money. if they decide not to adjust early, it, it might be some free money in the beginning of the season. Now, we saw a guy get popped with the pitch clock and, you know, led to a strikeout in one of the preseason games or one of the spring training games. Like, right. This, this, if a game, if games are ending on this stuff, it's going to be wild. I'm, I'm very curious to see what happens. Why don't you tell the wonderful people about how to drive us home? Give us directions. All right. Well, that's going to do it here for us here for the AM drive for this Monday morning. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys enjoy your week. We will see you guys on Friday with, of course, Fantasy Draft Friday and all the sports talk to get you caught up throughout the week that happened in sports and in previewing the weekend in sports. But until then, I'm Aaron Krauss. That's Michael Carvella saying, enjoy your week, enjoy the sports. And of course, as always, drive safe. We're out.